uh, yes we are live on youtube so you want to start manoj or no you could make the announcement with the technical yeah. so welcome all to intercrypt 2020 so we'll be having uh, a tutorial now so formal introduction will be made by manoj and uh, the session chairs so before we start i have a couple of instructions uh, please use your real name so that we can identify you so this only corresponds this only applies applicable to those who have logged in via zoom and uh, uh, so you can uh, and again so this is only for uh, those who have uh, registered so you can please post your questions on zulip chat the link you can see on the chat window uh of this session and also this is being streamed on youtube channel so the channel link you can uh, again see it in the chat window so that's all or maybe it took okay. 10 yeah, seconds yeah thanks for your so yeah we'll, welcome everyone to indocrypt 2020 uh so the official program with the talks will start uh, later in the afternoon uh what we have right now is a pre conference tutorial we are very privileged to have uh, professor uli mor uh, give a you know uh, extensive tutorial that he'll be giving now with his team um, on constructive cryptography the session will be chaired by chris rushka and uh, anath uh, paskinjanevski so chris and anath uh, you can take over hello hello um so uh, i'm Uh, good morning everyone i'm or afternoon or night uh, i'm also very happy to uh, welcome all of you to our tutorial on constructive cryptography uh, which will be given by oli maura chenda lu zhang and mata mulachik and uh, so we will start the tutorial with an introduction to the constructive cryptography framework a theory and goals and uh, i would like to quickly introduce oli and, and highlight some of its uh, many contributions to um to cryptography uh so we has contributed important ideas to secure multiparty computation especially i'd like to highlight this construction of general mpc from uh, linear secret sharing and um very important for this session at willy is known for contributing useful uh, concepts and influential definitions to our area so um in particular i would like to highlight indifferentiability and random systems and most importantly for our tutorial today uh, constructive cryptography so um really please go ahead thank you chris i tried to share hope it works um seems to work okay good so i would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this tutorial and i immediately said i would like to have some team members join and they will present case studies after my presentation the my presentation will last about 90 minutes and then chenda and marta will present case studies for 15 minutes minutes each i would like to start this by looking at a very basic first i should say that this the abstract framework i'm talking about is joint work with benato renno one of my former students he's also from eth and then of course this draws on joint work with lots of people uh, including chenda and marta who will present today and i would like to start with a very simple and basic question an important concept in cryptography is that we have key generation protocols and and we can ask well okay we see such a good protocol can we actually use the secret key safely in now in for encryption or for some other purpose and i tried to look at this question early on in the 2000s when renato ren had joined my group and here we have a very simple statement one one time pad encryption is provably secure uh, we all agree secondly quantum key distributions for those who know it is provably secure this is all information theoretic no computational assumptions and so it should be clear that one time pad encryption with quantum key distribution is secure this should be a no brainer so i asked the following question is it true that 1 and 2 imply 3 okay and i asked this question to renato 
And to our surprise, it turned out the answer is no. Okay, this implication doesn't hold. So something must be intrinsically fundamentally flawed if the conclusion from these two statements, important statements in our field, is not that we can conclude three. There is no composition in the natural sense. Uh, this was in, in the early 2000s, I should say, it was cleaned up by new definitions, new security definitions, a new framework for quantum key distribution by Renato Reno. So today we know how to do it, but at the time, at 2005, this was true, okay? And more generally, we can ask the same question, of course, for computational cryptography, if you wish, for our protocols that we design. Can we compose things? That's the fundamental question behind this. Now, there are many themes in this talk, and they will appear interleaved. So first of all, I'd like to talk about an abstract construction slash resource, resource theory. Uh, then I would like to demonstrate constructive cryptography as an instantiation of this abstract theory. Then I would want to instantiate constructive cryptography by a discrete system theory. What are these boxes that we draw concretely? Uh, what are discrete systems? I will have lots of examples for motivation. And it's also about motivation and positioning. What are we doing here? Not just technical stuff, but what is the whole purpose of it? All these aspects will appear interleaved. I will not start with the first point, which mathematically would be most natural, but if I started like this, you would not understand why I do it. You might think this is too abstract and so on. So I will start actually with examples first, but let me first talk about the general approach to capturing knowledge in a mathematical science and cryptography is a mathematical science. Uh, what does it mean to capture knowledge? Ideally, we would like to have a library of a minimal set of laws and facts, which we have in this library of knowledge. It should be maximally reusable. We can use these facts in various places for various purposes. It should, of course, be simple, meaning abstract. It should not carry details that should be in those statements. And naturally, and this links to this addition of intercrypt, it should, of course, very naturally link to formal proofs, uh, because if things are simple and abstract, it should be natural to be able to prove them formally. And there should be automated derivation of facts using rewriting rules. You can simply take some facts from the library and derive new facts, uh, again, relating to formal proofs. But now the questions are, if you take this very, very general viewpoint, which I would like to apply to cryptography in a while, uh, what, you know, what, which types of statements should be in the library about which types of mathematical objects and how are these statements composed? Take a few statements from the library and derive new statements. And I should say that this is orthogonal to a very important issue, namely how we prove these statements, okay? Uh, of course, at the end, it would be nice to have fully formal proofs, maybe even a special purpose calculus developed for these kind of proofs. Uh, but you can also do paper and pencil proofs. And what, what you see in this lecture are paper and pencil arguments in the usual way we do it. But it should be clear that uh, you, you can take it a step further and, and make these proofs formal and actually you know, in a sense, from the outset of, of developing this theory, it was intended to be rigorous and you could say, you know, formalized in a proof system. Okay, so let me start with a fundamental concept that's in the title of this tutorial, the construction concept. I'd like to present it as an extremely general concept that appears in many contexts. I'll, I'll mention a few. We have some resources, okay, this could be software modules, let's say, which are given to us. And then we do a construction using these. We put the software layer on top, let's say, and we create a new module as an interface to now to this new module. And what we want to say is that this whole construction is identical to a single resource, let's say, which is really a good specification of a software module, for example. Okay. 
That's a very general way of thinking. And there are lots of areas, in fact, any constructive discipline thinks in this way, in a modular way. You construct ma machine, a machine from parts, uh, you construct a software module from software modules, you bake a cake using ingredients, you, let's say more cryptographically, you construct a strong randomness source from a weak randomness source, error correcting codes, you construct an error free channel from noisy channels, cryptography, you construct a secure communication channel from an insecure channel and the key. And you can imagine you can go on in almost any uh, precise discipline, this paradigm, paradigm arises. And this is why I address it first. Uh, and want to see what we can say about it. I should now say that actually we talk not only about concrete fixed objects, but we talk about specifications. So what I actually want to say is that this object, the real object that we construct is satisfies a certain specification S1. It's contained in the set of all objects which satisfies a specification. I'll get back to this point a little later after seeing an example. And then another, of course, important idea is that if, if I don't find this resource anywhere in a library or in nature, I might want to construct it myself. So here is a construction from some other resources, Q1 up to Qn, which constructs R1. And of course, what I can do is I can simply plug in this construction for R1 and now it's still true, if this is all meaningful, it's still true that this entire construction is contained in this, satisfies this specification. And we could view, if we wanted, this to be a construction. This is the construction now, this whole thing, of this resource specification from all these purple resources. This is a good point to mention that the colors purple and green will be go throughout all our presentations. Uh, I'll, of course, explain more what they are, but the purple objects are the resources, the things we assume to be given, and the green objects are the recipes, the constructions, what you have to do. I'll say more about this. But let me now do an example first. And intentionally, I do an example which is not from cryptography because the whole theory is not about cryptography. It's much more general. It just allows to express cryptography as within the framework. So actually the framework should not be called constructive cryptography, constructive cryptography for which is a fragment of the general theory. So let's look at error correcting codes. What is the goal? Again, here we have the purple objects. What we'd like to do is we have a noisy channel with an error probability delta that does bit flips of probability delta, we can send n bits over the noisy channel. And we would like to get a k-bit error-free channel, which is shown on the right side. This is our goal. How do we do it? Well, we apply a construction. We apply coding and decoding. And the hope is that this object on the left should approximately be the object on the right. There is an error probability epsilon, maybe. Okay. So I can also already start writing this sort of algebraically. I can say this object here, you know, where the idea is they're algebraically composed somehow. This object is epsilon close to a, a perfect, a zero error channel. Okay. And actually, according to what I said on the last slide, I want to think rather that it's contained in the specification of all channels, the error free channels, but only an epsilon approxim approximation or I will call this a relaxation later. It's contained in this, if you want to say ideal object, but you have to relax it by epsilon. It's only epsilon close. Uh, and I can now write this as a construction. I could say I can construct using this green objects, how you do it, coding and decoding. I can construct this re relaxed version of an error-free channel from a noisy channel, okay? This is the error correcting codes example. And I, I hope that this appears very natural. And even for people doing information theory and coding theory, while this is absolutely not surprising to present like this, it is nevertheless a new, a new viewpoint. The usual, usual language you would read 
in, in that literature would be that you look at a code, you know, corresponding to this somehow, and then you talk about the maximal worst case error probability of that code, and you show that it's epsilon and so on. But what it actually means is, is shown on this slide. This is a very natural way to present that statement. By the way, it's also clear if you present it like this, that the epsilon probability has to be a worst case decoding error probability, not an average case error probability. All these things would become explicit once you force yourself to phrase things in such a framework. Okay, good. Um, now let me go back briefly to this idea of specifications, right? That the idea that this object, the actual object, is contained in a set of objects which stand for a specification. So the idea is that a specification R is a subset of the set of all possible systems one can talk about, one can imagine, the universe, if you so wish. And of course, a, spec a subset corresponds to a property or a predicate of the system. If you take a subset, it's just the set of all those that satisfy that property or that predicate. Uh, and the smaller R, in a sense, the better, the stronger is the specification, the more you know about it, right? If you narrow it down to a single point and say, I know exactly what the system is, it's not just the specification, you know the most. On the other hand, if you say, I don't know anything, it's just any system in this whole universe, it's the trivial specification where you don't know anything. Of course, that's useless in general. Uh, and, but the idea is that very often, if you take a specification, S, it is meaningful to actually not talk about S, but talk about a relaxation T, a, a larger specification, which you can see as an abstraction of S. And the idea is that this abstraction may be easier to understand and work with than actually S. So to put it looking ahead, to put it in the context of cryptography, you know, and maybe using some language that we use in our field, you could say this is the real system, but we actually want to say it's contained in an ideal system. We give an ideal specification and that's easier to understand. It doesn't talk about all the details of the real system it abstracts away things we don't care to talk about and it gives us an, an abstraction. What is important is that all this talk, you know, if I use the term ideal system, I might not use it often, but the idea is it's really a containment in a mathematical sense. It's not some kind of uh, realization concept or some kind of concept that needs a, a, a technical definition, I only talk about the most simplest mathematical thing you can talk about, set containment. I simply say this system satisfies a certain specification which we find useful. Okay, so much about the specification concept. Usually these objects that we show are actually specifications. You can think of them as being sets of systems and we don't care to say exactly which element in the set it is, it's just the set of all systems that satisfy certain properties. Okay, so let me now do a few more examples, one more example to illustrate how we think. And I'm getting closer to cryptography, I look at the notion of an extractor, okay? What are the resources that we need? On one hand, we have a source specification, namely the set of all systems which output a random variable x according to some distribution which has sufficient entropy, let's say sufficient mean entropy. Okay, this would be a specification. That's why we need the specification concept. I do not want to say which distribution it is. I talk about the set of all distributions that satisfy certain property. In this case, an entropy property. What I also need for an extractor is an independent uniform string, a, sh a short string often called the seed. This stands for a uniform k bit string. And now the extractor is now the construction, the extractor applied to these two systems 
gives us a new system which should be very close to a system which outputs a long uniform random stream. It extracts the randomness from S, okay, thanks to this seed. This is only approximately true, epsilon close in some sense. So the, the lemmas on extractors would talk about what the epsilon is. That of course depends, for example, on K, N and M, obviously. Uh, but again, the way I want to think is simply, I want to understand this as being contained in the set of systems which are ex epsilon close to a uniform random stream, where this is say statistical distance, okay? So this would be, and I can now write it algebraically if you wish, you know, this is already closer to, if you think of this being formalized in a formal system, this is actually the statement about extractors, okay? Now I can go a step ahead and say, what if this the seed is not secret? What if we do what is also called uh, privacy amplification, in which case we need a strong extractor. Okay? In this case, this seed is a public randomness, a public random string of k bits, and it's shown on the right side. On the right side of this resource, there is also an interface which Maybe I can use the word, it's accessible to the adversary. The left side is accessible to the honest party or parties. The right side means it's accessible to the adversaries on this slide. And we make explicit that the seed is accessible to the adversary, okay? Um, now, obviously something has to change on the right side because you see a random string on the right side. So this picture is not correct. So what I might want to say is, I might want to say the right side is a system which is on the left side, as before a uniform random string, epsilon relaxed. And on the right side, it's independent, a k-bit random string. So we want to say that what we see here gives something which is independent of what the good guys see, the adversary gets an independent random string or written algebraically would be written like this, a strong extractor extract from this source and this public randomness, this pair, where this is meant to be independent. However, it turns out this is not true. Once we force ourselves to speak this precise language, we actually realize this is not true, okay? We have to relax the statement and actually instead say that the epsilon relaxation doesn't apply to just UN, but it applies to entire pair, okay? So we have to show it, uh, the relaxation should be put on the entire object, but this is fine. How to interpret this, we can say, uh, we construct something ideal, namely a uniform random string for for the good guys, an independent k bit string for the bad guy, and the whole statement has to be epsilon relaxed. It's only true with probability one minus epsilon, but epsilon is very small. That's how we can understand the treatment, the statement. And note, by the way, that this specification where the relaxation is over the pair is contained in this specification. So there is a set containment here. Okay. So this is how we want to think. And it was just one more example. I do a number of examples, for example, encryption and so on in, in a little while. But before I do that, I would actually like to look back historically and, and show you where the, this whole project started for me. One starting point was this insight into quantum cryptography that I showed on my first slide that which showed that some very simple statements don't hold if you don't do it right. But a much earlier starting point was actually this. It was uh, a calculus, I, it was called a, a dot calculus. I'll show in a minute what it is, uh, which I developed in the early 90s for didactic reasons to actually teach cryptography. So the next five to 10 minutes are dedicated to an intuitive didactic way of explaining cryptography to students. Uh, and it was published in a paper a little later by myself and, and Pierre Schmid. Um, and these are now actually cryptographic constructions. So it started by trying to explain a MAC scheme, message authentication code scheme to students, right? Who know nothing, let's say. 
And it would be easy to try to say the following, a MAC scheme is used to construct an authenticated channel from A to B. I use this symbol here just to say it's an authenticated channel from A to B. Why this bullet? Because that side of the channel, Alice's interface is exclusive to Alice. Only Alice can input the message. This is what we mean by authenticity. If B receives a message on that side, uh, Bob knows that it comes from Alice because only Alice has access to the channel. That's why we have this exclusiveness bullet here, okay? But now the question is, okay, constructs an authenticated channel. This seems intuitively to capture what a Mac scheme achieves, but we actually have to ask from what does it achieve it? We need some guarantees to start from. We need an insecure channel denoted like this, and we need a shared secret key denoted by this symbol, okay? These are the symbols I used back then. And then I can show this you a little bit more mathematical by saying, these, if we have these two ingredients, an insecure channel and a key, a MAC scheme allows us to construct an authenticated channel. And already now you can see that, of course, this authenticated channel should then be reusable in another construction where we need an authenticated channel, okay? So this was a didactic way of teaching things. At that time, in the early 90s, I did not have a mathematical framework for explaining what this exactly means, but I presented today, this is the constructive crypto framework, which gives clear meaning to all of this, okay? Another natural uh, construction would be that a symmetric crypto system, symmetric encryption, constructs a secure channel. I have this symbol now, it's both authentic and confidential. It's a fully secure channel. And it constructs it from, well, from what? From an authenticated channel, because you want that if you use symmetric encryption, if you don't use authenticated encryption, just normal symmetric encryption, then uh, you, know, you need an authenticated channel, you need a secret key, and you construct a secure channel. It didactically, this seems very intuitive. And of course, you can combine the two now. You can use this authenticated channel as the precondition in this construction step as this authenticated channel. And you can compose the two. And this is, if you draw a picture, then it would look like this. It's called encrypt and Mac. You would first have a key and an insecure channel. Here, I just draw pictures. You know, this picture means to say a random key is generated in the system, it's given to Alice and Bob, and nothing is given to Eve. And the insecure channel is a channel which is accessible to Eve and Eve can even input a message. Of course, what this object exactly is would have to be clearly defined. And if we write the paper, we define clearly what this is. There could also be variants of insecure channels and so on that I might talk about later. But in any case, the MAC scheme you know, we now see that the MAC scheme is actually a pair of converters, right? It's a MAC scheme is a pair of these objects. It's a converter. I call these green objects converter. A converter that applies the MAC. The message comes in here. Then the key is fetched. The MAC function is applied. And output is the, the message together with the MAC sent over the insecure channel. And the receiver checks whether the MAC is correct, apply, fetches the key, applies the check function, and outputs the message only if the check succeeds. And so this entire object here, this box, is an authenticated channel, which can be, if Eve wants, it can be deleted. The message can be deleted, so Bob would see no message has been transmitted. Namely, if Eve tries to tamper with the channel, then this would be detected. So this authenticated channel is a channel with uh, the capability for Eve to er erase the message. And then this channel is now used to, with encryption shown here. This is the encryption converter. It fetches the key, fetches the message from the outside, input into this virtual secure channel. It's encrypted. The output is given into this channel, meaning after the encryption, you apply the MAC. But to understand the encryption, we don't even need to understand what's in here. This is just an authenticated channel, okay? 
So we compose this construction here. Excuse me, I have to pay attention to the delay. We compose this construction here with this construction here. This is what is shown graphically in a different way on this picture. Okay. It's supposed to be very intuitive. Um, now I just explain very briefly some other uh, constructions which you can explain like this. For example, the Diffie-Hellman protocol can now be explained as follows. If Alice and Bob have an authenticated channel in each direction, of course, on which they would exchange the Diffie-Hellman values that they generate on each side, then the Diffie-Hellman protocol, the two converters that Alice and Bob would apply, constructs a secure channel. This also makes explicit that this only works if these channels are authenticated. Note that I will, in this language, you don't talk about the meat in the middle attack that you want to prevent. That's not a language that appears in this way of thinking. All you say is if the communication with Alice to Bob is authenticated and also in the other direction, then the different protocol gives you a secure key. Public key encryption could be explained like this. If Alice has the capability here of sending a message authentically to Bob, namely Alice's public key would be sent over this channel, and Bob can send an authenticated message to Alice, namely the cipher text of the encryption, then this public key encryption scheme allows us to construct a secure channel. The channel from Bob to Alice is now secure, it's confidential. The application of public key encryption provides uh, that, that the channel is now secure. This is what actually a CPA secure public key encryption scheme would achieve. Now, if you would ask me, well, what does CCA security achieve? Why do we need a stronger security notion than CPA security? The answer is the following. If I remove the bullet on the left side, then what happens? Well, we can still get this channel on the right side, a confidential channel, but we lose the bullet on the right side. It's not authentic anymore. Alice does not know it comes from Bob. Okay, We don't have a bullet here, but Bob knows if I send the encrypted message, it's confidential for Alice. Nobody else will read it. That's why we have this bullet here. Okay. Again, better maybe is to first construct an authenticated channel and then only use an a CPA secure scheme to achieve a secure communication channel. This is how you can argue in such a calculus. Uh, another construction would be a digital signature scheme. The idea here is that if you have an authenticated channel to transmit authentically the signature public key, Alice's verification key, public key, then later Alice can send insecure messages, but signed, but insecure transmission to Bob and Bob can verify the signature and hence lifts this insecure channel to become an authenticated channel on the right side. Okay. I will not talk more about what can be done in such a calculus. We could also talk about trust and the, and the role of trust and explains the public key certification and things like that. But this is not the purpose of this talk. I now switch back to uh, to my the actual theme of the course, okay? Uh, uh, is, it, uh, is it okay to, to ask a question now or do you prefer to, to get questions later? It's perfectly okay to ask questions. This may, I, I might say, you know, I, I answer them later or so, I, I have to give a short answer, but perfect, it's perfectly fine to ask questions, yes. Okay, so there is one question by uh, Benjamin in the chat asking uh, about the connection to, you know, to the UC framework. Okay, I mean, this is a complete... Uh, so maybe it, it's more suitable like later. Uh, at the very uh, end. In fact, you will see that in my entire talk, I, I won't mention any other framework, uh, not because I want to diminish those or hide them, but it's actually not necessary to talk about them. At the end, you might ask, what's the relation? I might say, 
perhaps you see is a, is a fragment or an instantiation of what I'm presenting. Uh, but I, I get back to that question. Yes. We can take it up at the end. But it's, I see. Not okay. it's not necessary to think that way. And by the way, what I show here, of course, predates any kind of composable framework. This is a way of thinking that originates, you know, was the, the originating point of constructive crypto, but admittedly at that time, there was no framework that explained it. And this is what I now talk about. Just one more observation about this dot calculus, namely that we have a conservation law. We note that only bullets that appear on the left can also appear on the right. It's possible to have a bullet only on the left that can be meaningful, but then you only have a bullet on the right. Uh, if you add this bullet here, we saw that you can also get it on the right. Okay. There's, a, there's another question by yes. uh, Muhammad Usama Sada. Um, and the question is, is the core concept something like starting from a trusted root and accounting for composable security where um, root of trust is kind of the minimal thing that we trust, for example, a piece of hardware. Let me bluntly say yes for the interpretation that uh, the person asking has of what the trust root and so on means. But we could go into details, what does that word mean, right? Uh, but I think, yes, the, the meaning is really, and I get back to it to explain very, uh, sim a very simple framework that allows us to mathematically precisely capture what we want to say. And let me do another example that should illustrate this. This is really a very simple example. You can talk about it in, in one of the first lectures of any cri basic cryptography class. I just phrase it in these words. Suppose I can send a short k-bit message authentically, let's say over the phone, or I read it to you over Zoom now, you see me speaking, it's authentic, but actually I want to send you a very long message, a, mega, a, a gigabyte long message, M, it has N bits, authentically over the internet. I can send you a mail in parallel to talking to you now. What I talk to you is authentic, but I can only read a few digits to you, a few letters, but I want to send uh, a mess, uh, you know, a message authentically. How would you do this? And I imagine I could now let you think a little while or wait for answers. Maybe let me not do this. The, the answer that most people after a few seconds of thinking would give is the following. But let me first point out, I can phrase it like this. I can phrase it in the same way of thinking. I can say, you know, given a short message, k-bit authenticated channel and an insecure n-bit channel, what can I do? How do I construct an authenticated channel? Okay, and the answer is not surprisingly that we would give it's, oh, you hash the message and you send the hash value over the authenticated channel. I would read it to you over Zoom and the insecure message I send over the insecure channel and the receiver would verify the hash and if it's correct, it would accept the message and that's why you would have an a, a bit authenticated channel. I just described this in this language. I forced myself to phrase it in this language and now we see that this, the pair of converters, Alice would hash the message, Bob would verify the hash. This is the construction that gives us this, okay? That's the idea. Now, we observe something which cryptography has been struggling with since a long time, namely, this sounds all intuitive. And as long as you don't ask me to make it precise, it seems to make sense. But now let's make it precise. Informally, we, in the usual way of talking in cryptography, we'd say we have a theorem that says, if H is a collision resistant hash function, then this authentication system is secure. Then this is achieved. Okay, this is what we would like to say, but we note and all know a concrete hash function is not collision resistant, of course, because there exist collisions and hence there is an efficient algorithm for a fixed hash function H, which would output collision efficiently. And this is why we start doing strange things in cryptography and introduce asymptotics and say it's actually an asymptotic family just for the notion of collision resistance to make sense. And all of a sudden, our statements don't talk about SHA-3, 
or some other hash function they talk about, talk about an asymptotic family, which is not even defined if you look at concrete schemes. And we have a mismatch. This is not necessary. I will get back to this example and I will explain in which sense this statement here is actually true, mathematically true, in a completely non asymptotic way. All I have to do is I have to relax the channel on the right side. I have to say this is true up to a collision event, okay, unless a collision occurs. And all this I make explicit. And it's completely not necessary to talk about collision resistance of hash functions. It's not necessary at all, okay? For now, this may be a bit hard to understand if it's a promise for later, okay? I make this precise later. Let me now do another example. I promise lots of examples to show you that, you know, whatever you may have in mind is probably expressible in the framework, at least with help, you know, how you can express it. And now I look at the one-time pad example, an example I used from the early days on. And the idea here is we have a, a secret key that Alice Bob share. We have an authenticated channel. The key has the same length as the message that can be transmitted on a channel. And one-time pad encryption says, I take the message that should be sent over the virtual secure channel. I fetch the key at XOR the two, send the resulting ciphertext over the channel. Bob does the same, fetches the key, fetches the message, XORs the key and outputs the message. And this should correspond to a secure channel shown here, okay? And all those known, familiar with some form of composable framework, they would know that this is not quite true. It's not just this system here. You have to attach what is often called a simulator. You have to say, if, who gets the length of the message, Okay. If who gets the length of the message, and now it, this makes it sense that the secure channel must leak the length of the message, uh, can simulate what happens at this interface, can simulate by outputting just a random string. Okay? And in that case, these two systems, if outputting a, outputting a random string independent of the, of the cipher text of anything, uh, but of length, the length of the message, this system is identical to this system. So I can write it like this. Literally, this system, which I drew up here, which is mathematically defined what it does, is contained, and there is no strange notion here, it's, it's contained in this system. I write it a little differently now. I say this system is simply a system that gives a randomness resource to Eve, a, ran a resource that gives sufficiently many random bits to Eve, and then I say, if Eve has that randomness, she can also, and I explain, I explain this later, she can connect the randomness resource to this resource. She can connect the two in a way, this is the star relaxation, which I consider later, in, in a way that you get this system. Okay, I'll explain this later. And now I can also write this as a construction. I can simply say the one-time pad constructs from this pair of resources, a secure channel, and we make explicit that this construction actually gives something to Eve, something that's not really, doesn't hurt us, but it gives some randomness to Eve. If we were living in a world in which randomness is an expensive, rare resource for Eve, this makes explicit that Eve actually gets some randomness, which she didn't have before. Here, she doesn't have it, okay? And it must become explicit by the construction. Okay. Um, now we can easily switch to computational encryption. That's just the same figure. All I have to change is I have to say now it's normal encryption, you know, and decryption. I don't change this figure at all. And of course, the converters now do encryption and decryption. All I have to do is I have to re relax this system on the right side, this here, further. I have to say you must allow me to substitute the subsystem by another subsystem. By the way, in here, you would have the CPA security uh, distinction problem, if you so wish, but I don't even talk about a distinction problem. It's just a substitution, okay? And again, it's literal set containment, not 
as some notion that has to be justified by some, you know, a realization notion or something. It's literally set containment for mathematical objects which are precisely defined later. Okay. Let me contrast this with the usual language that we use in cryptography, which is something like this, right? We would have, uh, for example, the public key crypto system. I don't read it to, we're all familiar with this. It consists of three algorithms. There is a correctness condition. There is a security condition. Here it's the NCPA security condition. And we can ask ourselves, why are all these features in here? For example, there's polynomial time algorithms appearing, Turing machines. Why do we talk about Turing machines in such a definition? There's the notion of negligible. There's a notion of the two messages in the challenge have to be equal length. Why do we put this in the main definition that we're using, CPA security? Why do we put such strange conditions hidden somewhere in a text in the definition, you know, why do we do this and what does it mean? Okay, so anybody you introduce to cryptography would ask the question at this point, what does it mean? So there are two questions you can ask motivated by looking at this definition. First question is, what does this definition really mean? You know, what does it tell us? Why is it exactly like this? Why equal length? Why non-negligible? Why and so on? Okay, uh, where can we use public key crypto system that satisfies this definition. In which applications would it be insecure to use? In which application would it be secure to use? Which is the right definition for a given application, right? Do we need CCA security in another definition, for example? Okay, so this is the first question for which we need a systematic answer. And the second question is, the simple question whether artifacts like Turing machine, asymptotics, polytime, negligible, and so on are really needed. Is it necessary to have them in the formal framework, which would also go into the formalization if you do formal proofs? Is this really necessary? The first question is answered by constructive cryptography, by this constructive idea. And the second is answered by the general theme of this entire talk, abstraction do things abstractly and not concretely if it's not necessary to go at the concrete level. You can go at the concrete level whenever it's necessary, but don't do it before it's necessary. Okay. Maybe this is a, a good moment to fit in the, another question that uh, uh, Muhammad asked. Muhammad asked, how do you formalize uh, signatures in the construct, in, in the dot calculus? Uh, it was, if, okay, let me answer briefly. It's It was, on one of the earlier slides here, okay? Uh, sorry, it's here. I mean, we have an entire paper that does this, but here it's explained. In fact, this is if and only if a digital signature scheme satisfying the normal existential forgery definition, okay, if you think as methodically now, is exactly what it takes to construct from a a short message authenticated channel in which you can send the public key, the verification key, and an insecure channel later. I don't show times here. I can now introduce times uh, at a later channel. And that gives you an authenticated channel. Okay. This is, of course, we would now have to go technically what exactly are the converters and so on. I can't do this. But my very general and maybe a bit bold claim here is that anything you would want to model, we can model. Okay, if you want to talk about time, for example, not just discrete systems, we can model that. We need a new instantiation, a new concretization layer, but we can do it. Today I will not talk about time, but I would have a presentation that could talk about time, and then you would see how the framework can be instantiated for time modeling. Chenda will afterwards present an instantiation of the framework for synchronous systems, in particular synchronous multi-party computation, to show you that it can be instantiated, okay? Now the claim you can do everything you wish is a bold claim and uh, you might need our help to do it because if you're not used to thinking in this way, but uh, it's, it's just a bold claim I make. And I, uh, you know, I, I can take it back if we get into a concrete discussion where I, I have to think myself how to model it. Let me return to where I was which was here, okay? So now I really start 
the constructive cryptography framework. Okay, from now on, I draw the kind of figures you will see also in the case studies by Chenda and by Marta. Marta will present a case study that shows how to model secure messaging uh, in, in constructive crypto. Uh, and, and here I just start introducing the way of thinking. Okay, so we have objects which are resources. You can think of them as being discrete systems. You can give an input and you receive an output at an interface. For example, it could be a channel. Alice can input the message and Bob can fetch the message on the right side, something like that. And we have interfaces that can be named. Here I have four interfaces. That's just an example. You can have as many interfaces as you wish. This example could model, for example, that Alice input something, it's a channel, for example, Bob can receive it. There is an interface for Eve where we can model what Eve sees, maybe only the length, maybe the entire message, maybe she can, she can insert messages. We can model whatever we want. And there can also be what I call a free interface, uh, which can model that a message might, you know, something might leak to Eve at a certain point in time. This will be needed in secure messaging where only if a key leaks, for example, then the message will leak to Eve. This can be modeled. I can also have another free interface that models that the channel is not, uh, is not uh, reliable, that only under a certain condition, you know, an input at a free interface, Bob is able to fetch the message. And we want to model that time, point in time when Bob can see the message. Okay, all this can be modeled. We're free. We can have several free interfaces. We can have all other parties. We can have several adversaries, if we wish, which don't collaborate and so on. It's a completely general framework. You can model anything I claim you want. The next objects, as we saw already, are these converters. You know, Alice would apply a converter, maybe encryption converter. I forgot to put the pi one here for Alice. Bob can put the converter, let's say pi two. And this of course, as a whole generates a new system. Okay, and then we make statements about this system. We say how, in which specification it is contained, possibly putting a simulator at the E interface. Uh, but I won't use the word simulator later. Actually, the framework does not contain the notion of a simulator. It, you can interpret simulator based statements, but it's not needed to talk about them. Okay, so these are the kind of pictures we use. And for the following, I will now look at a very simple instantiation of the CC framework with only two interfaces. So the resources only have a left and a right interface. And the left interface will be for the good guy, okay? the good guy who applies a converter and the right interface is meant to be for the bad guy, if you so wish. The interpretation is the right side is the bad guy. And in fact, this is indifferentiability. If you have used indifferentiability before and you found it a useful tool, many people find it a useful notion. This, what I now talk about is actually indifferentiability. It's just a special case of the CC framework, okay? You don't, you can instantiate it immediately, but, but just saying I have a left interface, a good interface and a bad interface, so to speak. Okay. And now what we want to say is that this system is contained in another specification. That's the language we now speak. In fact, a little later, I will say it more abstractly, specifications don't have to be sets so that we have the subset relation. They can be objects in a more general uh, partial order in a lattice. And in that case, you could simply have a general order relation. Of course, this is a special order relation. Being smaller, okay, contained in this means it's better. It's a narrower specification. If I know this, I know more than if you tell me this. But the whole purpose of nevertheless relaxing this object to a, a wider object S is that this is a good abstraction call it the ideal specification, which you can easily understand, a secure channel where encryption doesn't appear anymore. It's just a secure channel, easy to understand and easy to use in the next construction step. Okay, so the construction notion is as we had, I, I write it now algebraically, you know, 
the specification S is constructed from R using pi if pi applied to R is contained in S. Or more generally, I could write this okay, instead of subset. And now we have a very simple lemma. This is the composition lemma of constructive crypto. You should contrast it with composition lemmas of other frameworks, which are enormously complicated and very difficult to get right. Here is the composition lemma. If S can be constructed by pi from R and T can be constructed by pi prime from S, then it should be true that the composition of the two uh, converters, you can imagine I attach pi prime here now, that constructs T from R. And the proof is just this, it's a triviality. You know, if I have this statement, it's this statement by definition means this, I can on both sides apply a function pi prime, applied on both sides of this statement. And the set subset condition still holds, obviously, this is a, a, a triviality. And now this is contained in T, that's exactly what the definition of this, and that's it, end of the proof. It's a triviality. It's, you, you get it by the fact we, that we think systematic in the terms of these subset relations, okay? Another point now is that you might want to prove impossibility results, unconstructability. You might want to say no pi can construct S from R, okay? There is no pi which would construct S from R. And there are lots of such impossibility statements. I will mention later the so-called simulator commitment problem, which makes statements, construction statements impossible if you do them in, a, in the UC framework, for example. But in our framework, this is, these impossibilities don't hold. They, they, they will show up as a, an artifact of the framework because we can, if we have an impossibility statement, it's very important to pay close attention to what these specifications are. And they really must be meaningful. If, for example, S is artificially restricted uh, in a way that is not necessary, but technically it's restricted, then something might be impossible, whereas de facto it's, it's actually possible, it's not impossible. I show such an example later. Okay. By the way, I suggest that I, I go on five or so more minutes, and the plan is to then have a 30 minute break uh, until 11. And then I will, I will continue for a while, and then I hand over to the case studies by Chenda and Marta. Okay. I should mention something else. Namely, you may wonder why do I have resources R and converters pi? Aren't they all at the end of the day Turing machines or at least programs, computers? Okay, like this computer does the encryption, and this is maybe a channel or something which could also be modeled as a Turing machine or something. You might wonder what is the separation between the two? And this is explained here. This is a very, very general basic principle. If you start doing something and it doesn't have to be cryptography, it could be any other field, you have to distinguish between things that you define to matter or cost and things which are irrelevant. Often, for example, in asymptotic frameworks, people say, polynomial time computation is irrelevant. And that would go, if you take that viewpoint, that would go into this object because it's by definition free. You don't want to see it in the analysis, it's free, okay? I will not take this viewpoint. For me, everything matters at the end of the day. Uh, so you could even say maybe time matters or energy dissipation matters if you want to, if you want to capture, uh, you know, attacks that are based on energy dissipation, stuff like that. We just have to decide what we want to model and then model it, that's the idea. But very often the converter that I draw and that Chenda and, and, and Marta will draw contains some computation. And I just want to illustrate how one can think about this. You can think that this computation takes place in a resource. So the encryption would be in a system, which is now a resource. And the actual converter is the simple operation of connecting the resource with the encryption resource. 
In that case, the converter would really be just a definitional object that says, connect them in the natural sense. And in this sense, the converter is really free of cost. How you connect is free of cost. What matters is how much computation you have to do for the encryption, for example, all that would now show up. It would be explicit that yes, encryption costs some computation. So whenever you see this picture here, you can also think of this picture where everything that matters is part of the resource. Every local computation is part of the resource, okay? If you now say, oh, this resource which does the encryption could leak something to the adversary, you can model it in this resource, put an interface here and say what exactly leaks of this. Every second bit of the ciphertext leaks, every, whatever you decide, you can model it here. Okay, you can model what leaks. You could, you're completely flexible to model whatever you want to model as being relevant. In any such concrete question, how do you model this? How do you model that? How do you model adaptive corruption? How do you model this and that? My answer will be very generic. I don't have to change this picture. This is going to stay. All I have to change is the definition of the resource. Something now leaks. Something changes in the resource definition. Okay, But not the framework it doesn't have to change. It's the same framework whether you have uh, that whether you have passive corruption or active cheating or something like that, okay? Okay, now an important concept is, as I mentioned before, that of specifications and, and relaxations. I have such an object as I discussed before, but I actually, in many cases, I cannot achieve an ideal specification unless I relax it. Information, theoretically speaking, I'd say it's the epsilon ball. I have to relax it by an epsilon error. Okay, so this is the epsilon ball around the specification. Another thing I might do is I might say, the bad guy can do something arbitrary on her, his side or her side, I don't know. So I relax it by an arbitrary converter on the right side. And this would be the star relaxation, okay? Uh, it's just everything that could happen uh, if Eve does something arbitrary. Okay? It's the guarantee that Alice or the good guy still have on this side, no matter what Eve does. This is, this is what we usually want. And then this is the specification. Now you could say, if I put a concrete element here, a concrete beta to show which element in the specification I have, maybe in the proof, then you, this could be called simulator. You could use the term simulator, but it's in this way of thinking, you don't need this term simulator, okay? There are other specifications we could do. For example, this specification is meant to say, this is an object, but now I only project it to what one can see on the left interface. I sort of block the right interface and, and say, whatever is visible on the left side is a specification of an object. That's also a relaxation of this entire object. I don't need this in this talk, so I, I just continue. Another relaxation that we need, for example, to do the, the authentication amplification example with the hash function is, is called game relaxations, or it's all, it was also called until relaxations in, in a recent paper at Crypto, which I mention later again, okay? It means after a certain event, maybe a key has leaked in the context of Marta's talk, after a certain event, we lose some guarantees. We relax the guarantees to not giving you any guarantee after an event. There would also be substitution relaxations to talk about things which are related to the distinction problem, to distinction problems, but I don't do this. I, I don't do this in this talk, okay? Okay, so now I can talk about uh, an abstract resource theory. I will do this relatively quickly, uh, but this is really meant to be the most abstract level of what I'm talking about. We have a set of resource specifications. 
think of this as being al algebra like the definition of a field we have a set a field or something it's completely abstract we call them resource specifications and they have a post set and a lattice structure so you have a partial order and you have meet and join on we don't talk about meet and join here just think of the post set structure something can be better than something else okay then we have that a function from this base to this base is, is a homomorphism simply if it preserves the order relation. If R is less than R prime, it should be the case that F of R is less than F of R prime. It preserves the homomorphism, uh, the, the, the function preserves the order relation, so we call it a homomorphism. It's a very, it's a technically sounding idea, but it's a very natural idea. You just have a, 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 an order preserving operation. And this whole theory is about the algebra of such homomorphisms. For example, we have then a monoid, it's a submonoid of all of these, of such homomorphisms, which we call constructions. And we say S is constructed from R using gamma if S you know, is at least as good as gamma of R. This matches what we saw before with the subset relation, which would go in this direction, in that case, right? I can also talk about constructability. S is constructible from R if there is a construction that does that. And, and uh, of course, anything that is better than S, I can construct by doing nothing, by just using the identity construction. Okay. And the main theme here is that we want to have a library of construction statements of this type in whatever instantiation of this resource theory that you might have, be it constructive crypto or more general theory, then we have a library of rewrite rules where we can automatically derive new statements from these statements based on postulated algebraic laws, axioms. It's an axiomatic theory, close to formalization, if you wish. And a particular instantiation like crypt uh, constructive cryptography as an instantiation of this must only prove that the axioms are satisfied, that certain homomorphic properties are satisfied. Okay, so let me show you the composition theorem of this theory. Again, it's it, it's completely simple. It says what you expect if gamma constructs S from R, gamma prime constructs T from S then the composition of the two homomorphisms of the two construction constructs T from R. And here's the proof why this works. And it's a very simple proof. It's already almost a formal proof what I wrote here. All you need is the homomorphic property, namely that you can compute the application of gamma and, and, uh, and uh, with uh, the order relation, okay? What we saw before. I don't go through this proof, it's very simple. This also means that the constructability relation is transitive, of course, what you would expect and hope. Okay, the next point about this resource theory is that we have we can have more homomorphisms. Now we introduce a, another submonoid, delta I call it, and these are called relaxations. So in a sense, if you relax an R, it becomes worse but certainly not better than R. We may have to relax things, for example, epsilon relax, because otherwise our statement wouldn't be true. So uh, as function, you could simply say, rho is less than the identity function. And now, of course, a very important property that you would abstractly postulate is that relaxation should be, very generally speaking, compatible with constructions. This means the following. If S can be constructed from R using gamma, it should be the case that you can automatically derive a new statement, put any relaxations on R, and automatically know that the correspondingly relaxed version of S is constructed by gamma. You don't have to change gamma. All you have to do is apply a relaxation on both sides. Why is this important? Well, it's important because a construction that gives you R in the first place in another construction step, maybe coming from a resource Q here, another construction step, maybe that construction only gives you a relaxed version of R, maybe an epsilon ball around R. 
And hence, all you know is that you get rho of r here, and then you want to still be able to apply this construction. And this is what is possible. You can say, oh, if r is only relaxed by rho, I can still do it. But note that the library of statements would only contain this statement once, and any corollary to it, namely, it also is true if you relax both sides by anything, by any relaxation, is implied by a rewrite rule. You can see this as a rewrite rule. I can even write it more elegantly. I can simply say that there is a one-sided commutation law between constructions and relaxations. You know, rho gamma is less than gamma rho. That's how you would write it. Okay. Here, by the way, it would be the proof that what I wrote here corresponds to this. I won't discuss this now. It's all at such a completely elementary level, you can already almost understand this as a form of proof in the sense of proving things in ring theory, for example, based on the axioms. Okay, last slide before uh, the break. Uh, now we can postulate algebraic structures on the homomorphism monoid. Okay, in the same sense as in ring theory, you might say I introduce specific axioms about integral domains or about special rings, which are called fields. And then I, I talk about vector spaces over fields and I develop an abstract theory. In the same sense, we can now put algebraic structure on, our, uh, on, the, on the given concept. And uh, for example, a simple thing is that a certain function, a homomorphism could be idempotent. Okay? In many cases, this is the case. In others, it's not the case. That would be a simple example of algebraic structure. Another is that a, a homomorphism might be indexed by a parameter, for example, a real number, epsilon. Here I talk about the monoid, but take the monoid of the positive real numbers, okay? Uh, and then you might have a rule that says, if you take the, the composition of an epsilon prime relaxation and epsilon relaxation, you can replace it safely by sum of the epsilons. What is here is the triangle inequality of a metric, okay? More generally stated. If you know that you have to relax by epsilon prime and also by epsilon, you can say, it's simple for me to simply write it like this. I sum up the epsilons and it's fine to do this because I've relaxed it. I get something weaker if this stronger thing is true but I prefer to think of this weaker thing, I can do it. I can forget this and simply write this. And I don't make a mistake because the inequality goes in the right direction. I only weaken it and hence I may do it. Then there can also be structure, a locality structure. This is very important. We might have a set of interface names, I, we saw that before, A, B, E, and so on, party names. And then each homomorphism has a scope. It's a subset of all sets. It applies only to Alice, it might apply only to Bob and so on. And then what we want to capture by this is that homomorphisms, for example, applying encryption at Alice's side, applying decryption at Bob's side, if they have this joint scope, then they commute. We have such a quality. So here it's a, a two-sided commuting property on the previous slide, we saw a one-sided commuting property, okay? But we can have more complicated properties like this triangle inequality and, 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 I cannot talk about everything that one might have. And in fact, people who want to use this theory might find it useful to, useful to introduce new such abstract structure that is useful in their context. It's an extendable structure in the same sense that that you, know, you can extend field theory by, by some other things and so on. It's not meant to be fixed for all, but this theory itself will not have to change. The locality structure will be there and all that. Okay, now I suggest that we take a break. We lost some time at the beginning. May I suggest that we reconvene at, at 11? Is that okay if we only have a 15 minute break? So the organizers we, would you want to take okay, some couple of questions question, before... Uh, or before the break or uh, i'm, I'm okay. very flexible i'm happy to take questions at any time yes now or okay. later as you wish okay you great so, so i think the break should be so people can catch coffee and all that 
I see. Uh, okay, so it's, it's quick, I believe. Uh, so that's another question by Muhammad asking whether uh, technically every, uh, everything could be modeled by resources rather than having uh, complicated converters. I guess just maybe resources uh, somehow directly connected without uh, converters. Like, would the system like that be equivalent? So, as I said before, you know, we look at this picture. This picture is very innocent. It should match. It should match everybody's intuition. Where you have some channels or a computer or something and a broadcast channel, and you do something with it. This is your local protocol engine. It should match most people's expectation. However, if you instantiate the theory, you have to make explicit what matters for you. You know, you might say. Uh, certain things matter and certain things don't matter. If I would instantiate it for me, I would say I want the converters to really be trivial. They're only a right. definitional object. They don't do any computation. They do not even split the th a string into two strings. A splitting a string into th strings would happen in a very simple and inexpensive resource that does it. And this is the viewpoint point that one should take. But the very important thing is there are these two types resources and converters, which also shows up in the framework I later presented, homomorphisms and the objects, right? I will not talk about the fact that the objects themselves can be seen as homomorphisms in the abstract framework, which is not written up at this point completely. Even the resource will be homomorphism, but let me not talk about that. I see, okay, thanks. Does that answer the question? This yeah. is really up to you, and this is a picture. Right. Meant to be right. So there is some freedom here. It's look, this it's not even messages are going in and out. It could be analog machines if you want to capture analog stuff. It could be quantum, right? In which case it, it is not even discrete and so on. This figure is abstract and captures anything. And after the break, I will explain what are my objects here if you want me to explain the examples where this is input output and it's discrete and so on. I will give you the mathematical definition of these objects, which gender would also need. But it's right. not necessary at this level to talk about it. And, and it will not be a Turing machine because it's completely unnecessary to talk about Turing machines. I see. Okay, thanks. That's, that clarifies. So Anna, uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Sure, sure. Uh, so yeah, actually very nice uh, uh, presentation. And um, also, it's, yeah, uh, you know, uh, very clear that it brings in a lot more power by being able to do automatic analysis. Um, but are there scenarios where, you know, it would be, so this is like, you know, when it works, it works really well, but for that, the kind of notion of security or equivalence, you have this observational equivalence kind of uh, condition, right? Like this uh, is a subset of the specification. I'm wondering, are there, uh, I mean, I could imagine there are definitions which are not that clean and therefore not that use, usable, not easy to use. Uh, to pick an example, suppose, um, say, obfuscation, right? The natural way we would model it would end up giving something like virtual black box obfuscation, something very strong. And then we have these other definitions like indistinguishability obfuscation which are not that easy to use. You have to, you know, they don't seem to compose nicely or anything. Uh, if you change, um, you know, you don't, if you absent perturb, then it, it doesn't give the same guarantee one would have hoped to get. You need a different you know, notion, right? Some different yeah. inputs I/O or something. Um, so there are these kind of uh, definitions, which do you think like, you know, for them, um, uh, is that to extend um, the constructed cryptography to yes. capture them also, or is it, yeah? Yes, so let me say a few, a few things about this. That's a very good question. Let me first say the following. If you look at a concrete setting, you know, you want to model what happens in your computer, and maybe you even go as far as modeling time aspects and, and energy consumption aspects and whatever, right? then this resource object will be as complex as what you want to model. You, this will not be abstracted away. This you have, to, you have to invent a model, an instantiation where you can talk about these objects which dissipate energy or whatever and, and use space on a chip or whatever you want to model. 
And then, of course, that complexity is not hidden away by what I'm explaining you. You have to do it. But you should only do it at the point where you intentionally want to go into that. Okay. Um, now, you know, how to capture obfuscation or things like that. And I'll, I'll, I'll say it again at the end. This seems to be very rigid. If you look at this picture, all we have is these objects, maybe a few more interfaces and these objects. And what can we express? We can't really express things here. It seems enormously rigid. Equally rigid as if you say, I just have to feel axioms. What is a field? I have just have to feel the axiom. It's rigid. You, you know, but because it's rigid, you could formalize it and so on. And the whole complication, let's say, or things which are subtle or things which require thinking and, and so on, they would go into what the resource is actually, what the specification is. And very typically, when we look at literature not written in such a language, then you have to think carefully about the, what the words mean, right? The obfuscation and so on, of course, there are different, different, what do they mean? And then you would have to phrase it as resources. If I now make repeat my enormously blunt claim, and this which should of course be taken by a grain of salt, that anything can be modeled, right? I mean, then I'm not saying that I can immediately, you, you know, you, you throw in a keyword like obfuscation, I will immediately be able to tell you what it is. And maybe I will have to, such things will force me to extend the framework, but the extension will typically be not in drawing this figure differently and hence changing the formalization that you already have in your computerized system. It'll be in the definition of these objects that I have to be an interface more, some other party who can do something, some other aspect that should be captured and so on. Maybe go to a, a more low level instantiation, not just discrete systems, but this systems that can talk about time, et cetera, et cetera. And, and each such paper that does something enormously meaningful in itself, I think can be strengthened, you know, the statement, if you phrase it in such a language. This is not immediate, this forces us to extend our thinking. And in many cases, we learn something actually fundamental or deep, and sometimes we don't. One thing that is actually quite obvious if I later continue, but it is a deep insight is that simulators should not appear in definitions, right? Every of our frameworks has a simulation concept. This is a concept that should appear in a proof. You might show something that you may want to call simulator, but it should not be embedded in the definition of what a secure construction or so means. Uh, I'll get to that. Does that answer your question? It was a long answer. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess it does. Uh, I mean, thanks. what I do is I declare my interface open to people like you, Manoj, who, who want to say, let's do this. Let's try to understand this. Can we do it? And in many cases, if you ask this question to me, I might say, I, I have to think. And I might think for a week and not have the solution. I might do some wishful thinking for myself and say, I, I, there must be a solution. I have experienced that at some point the solution comes. Uh, but it, we're challenged to say, let's, let's try to model it. And the advantage, of course, is if you can do it, it's all in the same framework, right? Yeah, so I, I guess just to... Uh summarize my question again it's more like you know this is when it, it's very powerful and it relies on things being actually a strong um, security guarantee right that, so that you can do all the composition in some sense if it's some sort of a weak security guarantee which maybe not even be meaningful but you know but and it's hard to compose then it becomes hard to capture as a, it's a clean resource, right? It will be some hairy resource. I yes. think that's what you're also saying, like, you know, well, yes, you try I to capture something which is- stand alone like, yeah. or no, notions which are not composable, right? Uh, they would show that in, mm. in many cases, I, I, if I'm very arrogant, I would say, if it makes sense in that paper you where you find it, then it can be captured. I, I know this is an arrogant statement, but in, in, in spirit, I would sort of, live up to it and say, you know, you, you can capture it, but it'll show up as a weak form of a resource, which maybe leaks stuff, maybe it has features you wouldn't want to have, but the fact that it's, it was not composed before shows up by the resource being weaker, and then it actually composes. 
Now, once you see that it's weaker, you might not be happy with it. You might say, but this is not something I can use, but at least you have a composable statement. Thanks. So we are uh, coming back in how many minutes? Uh, 10 minutes of the break. <laughs> so no. you want to reschedule it? What's your suggestion? Sorry, when, when are we back? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, like you want a 10 <laughs> minutes break? Yeah, that 10 minutes will be fine. If people are happy with just fetching coffee, 10 minutes is fine for me. Okay, so that means 11 5 for you and uh, 3 3 35 in India. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. See you then. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me, Chenda? Okay. Am I not audible by any chance? Good. Uh, Sham, uh, can continue? you hear me? Yes, sir, I yeah, I guess it's time. Oh, it's okay. Okay, yeah, yes, please, please, we, you can start. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Good. Let me continue. Or actually, maybe Chris could uh, open the session again. We saw this very abstract uh, level. Uh, let me go back and do one more example to connect it to things that we understand. Here is an explanation of Tiffy Hellman. Okay. This would say we have an authenticated channel from Bob to Alice, an authenticated channel from Alice to Bob. They use a key agreement protocol, Alice and Bob's side, let's say Diffie-Hellman. And what we want is that this is like a secret key, which we can then later use to do encryption and so on. And now in the usual way of thinking, we'd say there's a simulator here, which outputs two uh, group elements, random independent group elements, but I can also describe it simply saying this is a randomness resource allowing to output two group elements. And the actual system that we see here is contained in this system where at Eve's side, anything could, uh, anything could happen. She can connect this randomness resource so it behaves like the simulator, but this connection is costs nothing. It's just a connection. And then what we also have, what also has to appear is of course the, the, D, the DDH problem, right? And this would be by saying I can substitute the subsystem, which outputs three random values into a subsystem that outputs three D, uh, values satisfying the DFM operation. I don't talk about this, okay? But it's known as asymptotic. I don't have to start talking about the hardness of problems which already forced me to be asymptotic. Okay, what I do next, I spend some time in a, for a completely independent part. Now I would like to say, what are these purple objects, these resources as a mathematical type, if I choose to instantiate them by the usual kind of discrete systems that we have in mind, okay? So we have a system that takes a sequence of inputs, produces a sequence of outputs. After each input, it gives an output. Typically, I think that the output is actually given at the same interface. I can, for example, give an input, then I see an output. And the question is, what is this object mathematically? It will not be a Turing machine, uh, 
because there will be many different Turing machines that mean the same thing. It's actually the meaning of whatever we have in mind. And mathematically, this is simply a function that says for each input sequence, so for every element of the set of non-empty input sequences, it tells me what the output is. This is a deterministic system for the moment. Okay, I'm, to make it simple, I now to only talk about deterministic systems. It's exactly this object. For every input sequence up to some point, it's defined what the input at the output at that point would be. Okay. This is arguably, arguably the mathematical object corresponding to a discrete, uh, deterministic discrete system. Uh, and, and note that any, anything you might do by be giving pseudocode or even describing an actual Turing machine or something else is only a description of such a system, but the object itself is just this function. And a, a very important general principle in science, in mathematics, should be that we distinguish clearly between the type of objects, this object here, right, that I described here, and descriptions, which are convenient to work with in a paper, which are needed to formalize even. You need a particular language in which you describe these objects, not by function tables, but by maybe by a pseudocode of some kind. But those are descriptions. But the theory should talk about the types and not about the descriptions, okay? And there are many meaningful description languages. I, at the level that I presented here, I don't decide between which description language I use, okay? Now we can say a probabilistic system is simply a, a random variable over a deterministic system. The thing has internal randomness. And for each choice of randomness, it behaves deterministically, but it's now a distribution over deterministic systems. Okay, uh, but interestingly, it turns out that different such deterministic probability distributions over deterministic systems can have the same behavior. They are the same system. I give you an example. I take a system with, uh, extremely simple. It takes a single input bit and produces a single output bit. That's all. Okay, and there are four such systems. If you think about it. It can either be the system that always outputs zero, no matter what the input, it can be the system that always outputs one, no matter what the input. It can be the system that outputs the input, the identity system, or it can be the system that flips the input, complements it. Okay, there are four possible such systems. And now we can take distributions over these if it's probabilistic. We can, for example, take a 50 50 mixture between zero and one. It's either constant zero, constant one. We immediately see that this doesn't even look at the input. It's just a constant either zero or one. But we could also take a 50-50 mixture between the identity and the flip. So this would look at the input, but then 50-50 decide whether it outputs the input or its flipped version. And of course, what happens is that these two very different distributions, excuse me, very different distributions. They are the same system. In words, it's a system which no matter what the input is, it outputs a random bit. This is just a different characterization of the same system. Okay. So the actual object we should study if we study probabilistic systems is what I call the random system uh, in, in early work. It's the behavior of a probabilistic system. It's not a Turing machine with a tape where you, know, you can encode the same behavior in different ways. It's the behavior itself. And this is a, condition, a sequence of conditional distributions. Let's not go into the technical details of this. I just want to present that the next level, what are these discrete systems, has a clear answer. And we, we can develop a theory of discrete systems. I'll show a few things. Uh, actually, we can understand a random system S such a behavior as an equivalence class of all distributions over deterministic systems that have that behavior. I can denote the equivalence class like this. I can say this object, output a random bit, no matter what the input, that would be an object of this type, of this type, the distribution is uniform no matter what the input is, can be understood as an equivalence class of deterministic systems, of distributions over deterministic systems. And with this viewpoint, uh, we can, for example, do the following. 
In, at TCC this year, David Lanzenberg and myself proved the following theorem, namely that the usual information theoretic indistinguishability of S and T, two random systems, if it is epsilon, it's S and T are epsilon close, then there exist random variables over deterministic systems in the corresponding equivalence classes which have statistical distance epsilon. And this means that a statement in quotes, S is equal to T with probability one minus epsilon, which somehow you want to say if you see this, yeah, they're equal except with probability epsilon. This is now a mathematically precise statement. If, if you use the idea of coupling, uh, this can be made mathematically precise. So you can say, you can think of this as being equal except with probability epsilon. And what is very important, I, I don't have time to go into detail, is that this does not require a distinguisher concept. The entire presentation I give today can do without distinguishers, without adversaries, without environments, and anything like that. It's a pure system theory. System specifications are contained in other specifications. No need to introduce distinguishers. Okay? Uh, if one would want to and so on, one could do it, but it's not necessary for what I present here. Uh, it's much simpler. You don't need to formal. If you think of formalizing this in a formal system, no need to formalize the idea of a distinguisher. Unnecessary. You can express everything I'm saying here. Okay. Now let me go back to the example just to connect to this very simple example where in order to send a message authentically over the internet, we would hash it and send the hash value uh, over the internet. Uh, and, and let me explain this now in terms of resources. The resource that we assume the specification is an authenticated k-bit channel, an insecure n-bit channel. We even make explicit that Alice needs the capability to hash one message. So this is the resource that allows Alice to hash a single message. It even becomes explicit. This is a resource that allows Bob to hash a single message. These are all the resources that are needed. You could imagine a figure that shows all of these four resources in a picture. I, I don't have that picture, unfortunately. Okay. What is the constructed resource? Well, it's just an n-bit authenticated channel. Okay. Now, we all know this is not true because the hash function could allow for collisions and stuff like that. So it, this cannot be true. We need to relax it. Uh, actually, first, we need to say that Eve also gets the capability to hash two messages in the same way as the simulator we saw in for encryption, you know, gave Eve the capability to generate randomness, Eve gets the capability to hash two messages, okay? That's not much if she gets that. Then we need to say that, of course, Eve can do anything, which sort of stands for the simulator concept. Uh, and then we need to say, oh, we game relax this, whatever we say, we game relax it by, say, by saying if the collision event occurs in the ideal system, then we lose the guarantees. Okay, then the channel is not necessarily authenticated. And so here is how this would read in terms of a specification. Again, this is a subset relation. It's not a complicated asymptotic or whatever relation. It just says we take our resources, we apply the hash and check protocol that we discussed. And this very system, the real system, is contained in the authenticated channel, some hash capability for Eve, which is not bad, okay? A star relaxation, so Eve can do anything, of course, that doesn't cost. She doesn't get additional computing power. And then it's relaxed by the collision event, meaning if the collision event at this interface of this resource occurs in the ideal system, then, uh, then we don't give a guarantee. We give a guarantee only if the collision event does not occur. And this is the closest possible way to linking a collision event to a statement like this. There is no need to talk about hardness of finding collisions, which is meaningless anyway. It's directly the collision event that appears. Or any other game, like a discrete log game or stuff like that, that you might have in your protocol would appear as a relaxation. All right, now let me explain another point, namely that 
property-based reasoning, which people often use, Genda will present broadcast where you reason about properties of a broadcast protocol. Uh, of course, it is very convenient and one should do it that we say, if we have a specification, we decompose it as the intersection of several specifications, several guarantees. It's guarantee R1 and it's guarantee R2 and guarantee R3. This simply means it's the intersection of these specifications. So actually, in, in, if you use this framework, you would often have intersections of suspension specifications. Why is this useful? For, for many reasons, we can separately talk about each property, but we can also, for example, prove for each property that, you know, it's, it's abstracted by another property, separately for each property. We can reason at the level of each property separately. And what this means is that the intersection is contained in the corresponding intersection. Of course, trivially said theoretically, this is not meant to be difficult. It's an obvious thing. So we can reason at the level of properties, but this implies straightforwardly a statement about the entire specification that we might be interested in. An advantage of this is also that this individual specifications, this statement alone can be used in another context where maybe there is a fourth specification and so on. It can be used independently. I can give you an example of if we want to understand a secret key resource split into three specifications. Rather than being a single ideal system, you know, that spits out the key to Alice and Bob and so on, we could say this is simply the specification that says it's a system in which both parties get the same value. So R1 does not capture that it's random or that it's secret, only that it's the same. And that property alone will allow us to prove that if you use it in encryption, you know, Bob gets the right decryption, the channel works, it's correct. Forgetting about secrecy statements, it's just about the correctness of the channel. That the second specification might say it's a uniform key. Okay, it's chosen uniformly, which is not contained in this specification. The third might say uh, that nothing leaks to Eve, okay, for example. So this way we can think of splitting a specification into several specifications. Let me do an example. I, I try to do an example which cannot be treated as, as far as I know in existing composable frameworks. And this, this is leakable keys in encryption. A more complicated version of this will show up in Malta's presentation when she models secure messaging where keys can leak and you want to still keep security or heal the channel and so on. So fact is encryption provides a secure channel as we discussed, but the question is what is guaranteed if the key can leak? Do we still get a guarantee? Uh, the answer is should be intuitively speaking that the channel remains secure as long as the key did not leak. But of course, no surprise after the key leaks, the message in this ideal channel can also leak. Okay. So you'd imagine modeling this as a secure channel, which leaks after the, after the event happened that the key has leaked. Now it's well known that this is not achievable in a traditional composable framework. And the reason is that there is a so-called simulator commitment problem. That's often something that people use, a term people use. Intuitively, a simulator would have to output a cipher text at the time when the message is input. Okay. But later when the key leaks, the cipher text should be explained for the actual leaked key. And this is not possible. The, the simulator would be committed to whatever cipher text it output in the first place and cannot fix that later. So there exists no simulator. And hence, this construction is not achievable. Okay. How do we? solve the problem. There is a very simple solution. It was described already in, in a paper with Renato Renner in, in 16, but it was explained in more detail in, in this crypto paper of this year. We can simply say we give a specification, an intersection of two specifications, actually two star relaxed specification. The first says it is secret up to the point where the key leaks. And no guarantee after that, but it's secret. And yes, this is proven using a simulator. You can simulate this. 
but only up to the point where the key leaks. That's the first thing. It's secret. It satisfies these words. It remains secure as long as the key didn't leak. We make this mathematically precise now. And the second statement simply says, and it's, it's an authenticated channel that the message gets through no matter what, forgetting about secrecy. So this specification doesn't even talk about secrecy. And this talks about secrecy up to that event. And the whole point is that if you understand the star as you know, in the proof, you have to say which element it is, which simulator it is, the simulator can be distinct here and here in this specification. There's no need whatsoever to ask for the same simulator. Okay? That's the whole key. And of course, if you start thinking about it, there is no reason for wanting the same simulator. It's these guarantees, which we understand very precisely, secret up to that point and authenticated forever. That's all you want to know in a mess. Of course, in, not in words, but in a mathematically precise way. Okay, this brings me to the end. And I'd like to you know, draw some conclusions. Um, first of all, it may come as a surprise because often people are not enormously used to thinking abstractly, but of course, abstraction is the key to many things. It's an abstract theory, has rewriting rules. We can just automatically drive new facts. And what is important is that the abstract theory is intentionally rigid. It's algebraic. You cannot say, oh, and something leaks to the adversary and we want this modification of the model. It's rigid, okay? But the full flexibility and much larger flexibility than in existing frameworks comes from allowing arbitrary specification types, like what was on the previous picture, intersection of specifications and things like that, and more, more than that, you can imagine. And that's where the, the power of the framework comes. It doesn't restrict the framework itself, it allows you to define resource specifications for whatever you want to express. Also, in many frameworks, orthogonal issues are often compiled into the same framework, like computational models, for example. So what I present is completely independent of computational models. If you ask me how would they appear, I could, of course, say there, there's a layer in the framework hierarchy where I can express computational models and I can express programs on such models as constructing a random system from a given computer. I can express it, it would just appear as a layer. So you can even argue about software correctness in the same framework. You don't have to change the framework to do it. Uh, and many aspects are unified. You know, I'm not, I didn't talk about information theoretical computational security, something that people very soon would often say, is, is it information theoretical or is it computational? Well, you can ask that question, but the framework doesn't, doesn't talk about this. If it's an epsilon relaxation, you can say it's information theoretic. It's another relaxation, you can say it's meant to be computational. But we don't have to use these terms even. You can if you wish. It's not only for cryptographic statements, error correcting codes, you know, all the layers of the internet many aspects of which are not cryptographic, are other aspects, all those guarantees can be captured in the same framework. Synchronous, asynchronous, Chenda will just in a few minutes explain you an instantiation of the framework that explains synchronous protocols in a minimal mathematical way. Corruption types, we don't talk about corruption, the word didn't appear, but of course, if you ask me how to model corruptions that people use in the paper, static or adaptive and so on, I, one can explain it, one is actually forced to make precise what one means, you know, what feature of the resource is not ideal that it could leak or be taken over and so on. You could also model time, I didn't talk about that at all, and so on. Also, the simulation concept, as you saw, is not part of the theory, and this actually allows us to re-examine impossibility results. Uh, maybe for some relaxed version of the specification, the construction is possible. Uh, I didn't talk much about this, but the, th the system theory is actually environment-less, distinction-less, adversary-less. Uh, it's just the theory of systems, and it still can express what one wants to express. For most cases, I didn't talk about where more would be needed. Uh, I also showed that property-based reasoning, which is very convenient and is, is, is often used in the literature, is actually compatible with composition. We just interpret properties as specification. 
Also, I'd like to point out that I only need elementary mathematics, sets, discrete functions, random, random variables. Okay? It's elementary mathematically, no computational model, no Turing machine that would be very cumbersome to formally model and so on. It's just elementary. Of course, anything should only appear if it's necessary. The idea is you only introduce what is necessary. And of course, different instantiations of the system theory not the one I presented, the discrete system theory, you could allow for time modeling. I mentioned that for quantum software level, you know, features, hardware level, even you go down to the VLSI level. And so you could model that if you wished, not that we did it, but it would fit into the framework. And of course it would require all that knowledge that people have at that level. So I can say this statement without claiming I'm a software expert, or software correctness expert, I'm not. Still, I can say I would know how to capture those statements in the same framework. Okay. This concludes my presentation actually on time. Um, and I thank you. Uh, I leave it to the organizers. We have now two 15 minute presentations as case studies by Chenda and Marta. And the organizers, the session chair should decide whether we should take questions now or later or not at all. Um, th there are um, th there are no cute questions yet uh, at the moment. I, I still have some and uh, I'm sure other people also have some, but uh, maybe we uh -huh. can um, have uh, Chenda's and, and Marta's presentations uh, first, so then we can ask questions about all three presentations. Now I'm here. I made a mistake. I couldn't do it. Sorry, this is on my side. Okay. So should I take over or? Uli, do you want to make a sh short introduction or shall, shall I? <laughs> Uli, you're muted. Uh, could you admit yourself? Sorry, no, it's fine. Would you like to introduce uh, Chanda and Marta? So, Uli, do you uh, hear us? I think, I think he, he cannot hear us. Yeah, probably he cannot hear us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think he turned off the sound to cancel the echo. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so I guess uh, Chenda, maybe you could, uh, you know, say a little bit about yourself and then get started. So you're a student <laughs> at um, EPFL with uh, working <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. So I'm a PhD student at uh, Wallis Group, uh, and I'm going to present um, a case study on an instantiation on constructive cryptography. Okay, thanks. Take over. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. So, do you do you see the slide somehow? Yes. Okay, so I was gonna say thank you for the intro, but uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm gonna present a case study where we instantiate um, the constructive uh, cryptography framework to capture what is needed to state um, <clears throat> protocols and security guarantees in the synchronous model. So I'm gonna start with a synchronous model. So most distributed protocols in the literature of uh, multi-party computation 
including the many, many classical results like GMW, VGW, CCD, et cetera. And also Byzantine agreement protocols like uh, PSL, BGP, DS, and so on are stated in the so-called synchronous model. And such protocols assume or rely on the fact that parties proceed in rounds or according to a specific round structure. And this means that each party knows the, the current round, what the current round is, and they proceed uh, synchronously round by round. And whenever a party sends a message at round R, it is guaranteed to be delivered by the next round. And, and maybe one can ask, why are we interested in, in such protocols? And, and one answer would be because they are simple or simpler to design. And in reality, we can achieve such a round structure, assuming uh, synchronized clocks and an upper bound on the network communication delay. And the idea would be simple. Since we have synchronized clocks, we can all start the first round at some time tau zero. So let's say at 12 o'clock. And then each party sends the first round messages. And after delta clock ticks, say after two minutes, for example, or at uh, 12.02, each party will have received the messages from the first round. So everyone can start with the second round and so on. So the goal here is that we want to capture this meaningful setting and do that. And to do that, we need to um, instantiate several elements from the constructive uh, crypto framework. So we already saw this uh, slide where we have a set phi of uh, resources, a set uh, sigma of converters. And the basic construction notion, which uh, stated that when we attach a converter to any resource in specification R, we obtain a resource in specification S. So we need to talk about which construction statements we are interested in what resources are and what converters are. So first uh, we are interested in the multi-party setting. And here we have a set of, uh, we consider systems with N interfaces, one per party. And a protocol consists uh, simply of a tuple of converters. And the idea here is that uh, each converter models uh, the protocol engine that each party is supposed to apply. <clears throat> and then the construction consists of each party supposedly applying its own converter, right? And, and then we get some, some guarantee. However, in the multi-party setting, uh, an important aspect is that parties can be either uh, honest or dishonest, right? And while an honest party, we know that they apply, they execute the, the, the protocol honestly, right? They apply its converter there is no guarantee from dishonest parties. So the goal is, is to state meaningful guarantee for meaningful guarantees for the honest parties. So in the multi-party construction notion, what we do is we state a separate guarantee for each possible set of honest parties. So for example, if all uh, parties are honest, they apply their converter and the construction statement would state that this specification is part of specification S1234. Uh, uh, but if parties, for example, if parties one and four are honest, but the other two are dishonest, we would get a different guarantee or a different specification S14. Uh, Maybe another case could be that parties one, three, and four are honest and so on. So for each possible set of honest parties, we specify the obtained uh, guarantees. And one of the special cases often considered uh, in, in the MPC literature or in distributed protocols is that we only give guarantees if the set of dishonest parties is within a so-called uh, adversary structure. So for example, we want to say that uh, if the set of dishonest parties is, uh, has size at most T, Right? And this simply means that for those sets that have too many dishonest parties, there is no guarantee. Or equivalently, we, we, we would say something like uh, the resource uh, specification is only known to satisfy the trivial specification phi. 
Uh, another example would be the traditional simulation based notion. Um, so this is also, a, uh, so the, this construction notion also generalizes the traditional simulation based notion as well as partly explained where the ideal specification is described in a particular way, namely as an ideal system S with a simulator attached to the dishonest interfaces. And of course, one can see uh, the overall system S with the simulator as the ideal specification. And actually, we, we usually do not want to talk about the simulator, right? As long as such a simulator exists, uh, we are fine. And the way we phrase this in, 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 in our model is by, by modeling uh, the specification of a system S that has no guarantees at the dishonest interfaces. So this would be the star relaxation, right? And, and this corresponds to the set of all systems of the form S with any possible converter attached to the dishonest interface, in this case, interface two, meaning that anything can happen there. So this would be the multi-party construction notion. Uh, all that we have to do now is to instantiate the notions of what resources and converters are in our synchronous setting. So we model this as a special type of random system and resources are very simple. These are simply systems with N interfaces and they proceed in rounds, right? And at each round, uh, they simply take an input at each interface and then they produce an output at every interface. And this captures that all parties act in a synchronized manner, meaning that in each round invocation, all parties give an input to the resource and they obtain an output from the resource. And then converters are also systems, but with two interfaces, a left and a right interface. And then they take an input from the left, they produce an output to the right, and then subsequently they do the same kind of, but the other way around, right? They, they take an input from the right and produce an output to the left. And then with these two objects, uh, one can easily check that if you now attach a converter to a resource, this leads to another resource, right? Parallel composition of resources is also naturally defined. If we consider, for example, two resources in parallel, the parallel composition simply uh, receives a pair of values at each interface, and it inputs the first value to the first resource and the second value to the second resource. Then each resource outputs uh, a value at each interface and the pair is interpreted as the output at the corresponding interface. So as I said before, uh, the described resource type captures that all parties act in a synchronized manner. And, and one thing is that this implies in particular that any input given to the resource at round R depends only on the previous out outputs up to round R minus one, right? However, typically one allows the dishonest parties inputs to also depend on partial information, or maybe on all the information of the current round inputs from honest parties. This is what, what denoted often as, as rushing, right, in the literature. And to model such causality guarantees, we follow uh, a standard approach of dividing a round into two semi-rounds, which we denote r.a and r.b. And the idea is that in the first semi-round, the resource takes inputs uh, from the honest parties and gives an output to the dishonest parties. This would be some leakage. And in the second semi-round, the resource uh, takes inputs from the dishonest parties. Now this can depend on, on the leakage, right? And then give an output to all parties. So for the rest of the talk, I will give a few examples on how to state uh, resources in, in this particular instantiation. So for example, one could consider an authenticated channel that allows a sender to input a message at round K, let's say, and then it's guaranteed that the receiver um, gets this message at round L, right? And what we expect from an authenticated channel is that if both parties are honest, then the receiver receives the message 
from the honest sender at the corresponding round. And one way to model such a channel is by encoding this, uh, this property uh, as, as in the specification, right? For example, we can consider uh, the specification of all resources that satisfy the condition that we want, meaning that if both parties are honest, then the output given at the receiver's interface at round L is equal to what the sender uh, input at round uh, K. And another example is, is the broadcast channel. So, so and, and this uh, broadcast channel allows a sender to consistently distribute a message. And, and if one thinks about the, the literature of broadcast protocols, one usually requires two security guarantees. The first one would be validity. If the sender is honest, then all honest recipients uh, receive the sender's message, right? And the second guarantee would be consistency, meaning that in any case, even when the sender is dishonest, then all receivers get the same output, which I call Y. So if one, for example, wants to model a broadcast channel that allows a sender to input a message at round K and allows uh, honest recipients to receive uh, the, the message at round L, then one can simply encode both properties into the resource specification. So this means that we can define the set of all resources that satisfy the validity and consistency property. So that is that the honest parties outputs uh, at round L are the same and they correspond to the, to the sender's input if he is honest. And an advantage of specifying such a broadcast channel like this is that uh, this resource captures exactly what standard broadcast protocols achieve. And in particular, the proof um, <clears throat> that a protocol, that a broadcast protocol constructs this broadcast specification is exactly the same as the proof in the property-based case, meaning that we can give uh, composable semantics, right, to, to property-based definitions. So a last example, which I will not show, um, is, is the formulation of what traditional uh, MPC protocols achieve. So one can define a simple ideal uh, interactive computer resource in line with the uh, arithmetic black box functionality that was introduced by Damgard and Nielsen in previous work. And this resembles an old school calculator that has a small instruction set has an array of value registers and an instruction queue. And one can show that assuming a broadcast specification and a complete network of pairwise secure channels, then traditional protocols like VGW or, or simple MPC can construct uh, the computer resource, meaning that for each possible set of dishonest parties with size up to n third, one can get such a computer resource specification where the interfaces at dishonest parties are star relaxed. And for each set above N3, there are no guarantees. So here are some takeaway messages from this case study. So constructive cryptography can be instantiated to capture different settings in a simple manner. And here we saw an example of how to capture the meaningful setting of synchronous protocols, kind of a restricted setting. And the hope is that maybe this use case helps to, to lower the entrance fee, right, for those that are not familiar with composable frameworks. And maybe it, it might serve as a basis for formal verification. Um, yeah, and here you can find a link to the paper that describes this use case in, in more detail. And this, this concludes my part of the talk. Thanks, Linda. Shall we move on to Martha? Chris, mm -hmm. do you have questions in Zoom? Uh, maybe, 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 maybe I move my questions to, to the to the end. Okay. And um, so um, then, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe let me quickly introduce Martha. Um, oh, I already said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Marta Malacek is a PhD student um, uh, at ETH working with uh, uh, Early, and she's working on secure multi-party computation and secure messaging. 
So th yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, so my second case study will be about secure messaging. It's also a joint work with uh, Daniel Yost, who's now in NYU. Uh, so yeah, this will be a bit shorter. So maybe we can even finish on time. So um, yeah, hopefully. Uh, so first of all, this is about two-party uh, secure messaging or sometimes called ratcheting. So first I must say what this is about. Uh, and here we have this Alice and Bob who wants to exchange confidential messages over the internet. Um, this, uh, we are talking here, here about communication within uh, a session. So we assume that the parties already share a key and uh, the session should be long-lived. So think of chats, lasting for months or, or years even. And this actually happens quite a lot in reality. Uh, so this motivates this kind of very strong adversary who um, continuously leaks states. That's, that's the most important, I think, here. Um, so this means that he can break into um, to a party's phone, say, and leak all the secrets. Then the parties continue running the protocol, maybe refresh the secrets, then the adversary can break again, and so on. Uh, then, as usual, the adversary fully controls the network, so he can reorder, drop messages, and so on. Uh, this is asynchronous, right? He fully controls delivery. Uh, and we can also consider exposing or even controlling randomness, which models bad generators. Uh, so within this setting with this adversary, the goal is to basically protect as many messages as possible, both for confidentiality and integrity. So this kind of statement uh, generalizes the well-established notions of forward secrecy and post-compromise security, for example. Um, so going back to the example, what this means is that if the adversary leaks secrets of Bob, then some messages are inherently um, revealed. So confidentiality is lost. For example, this message can be read by correctness. Now for forward secrecy, we want that this leakage does not affect uh, all the messages that Bob already received. Uh, for post-compromise security, we want that if parties actually manage to communicate, uh, they send messages, they refreshed their secrets, and they restore security after the compromise. And we can also want something that we, I called here asymmetric. So this means that the sender state will not um, compromise confidentiality of messages he sends. Uh, so think of asymmetric encryption. So, so this is the setting, this is the intuitive goal, and you can probably see that it's going to get very complicated, very fast to define security of this. For example, there are so many things the adversary can do. He can leak the states, uh, use the leaked state to impersonate the party and so on. There will be a horrible commitment problem, which I will not uh, consider today because it's just too complicated, but you can deal with it similarly to uh, what Wally explained before. Um, so for today, I wanted to give kind of a very um, high level, maybe overview or intuition of, of how we approached modeling uh, two-party ratcheting or secure messaging in the constructive cryptography uh, framework. And here are the kind of, uh, I listed a couple of more general concepts that I want to illustrate on this example, and th they will become clearer uh, in, in a second. So the first is free interface, then we have events, and then we want to make stronger statements about um, uh, for, uh, what protocols achieve. So first of all, I want to recall the free interface that Wally already mentioned. Um, this is simply an interface uh, that does not get a protocol in the real world and it does not get a simulator in the ideal world. Uh, in the context of messaging, we will use it, for example, for memory resources to model the adversary that breaks into the state of the party. So there will be a memory resource with the free interface that controls whether the memory content is available to the adversary or not. Um, and yeah, of course, a, uh, an analogous free interface has to be in the ideal world. Another example that Wally also mentioned, I think, is that um, uh, of a channel. So the free interface could also control delivery of, of messages uh, on a channel. But here we're going to um, forget about this for simplicity. Um, so intuitively what this uh, expresses is that uh, anything can happen on, on the free interface. So it's, it's not part of the protocol. It's not... Uh, kind of arbitrary adversarial behavior. It's just arbitrary thing. So that um, we make a statement for, for no matter what, what happens, how the property switch of a resource switch on the free interface. For example, here, the memory can become corrupted at an arbitrary point. 
So this is how we model memories. Um, with this, let's go back to secure messaging. And I want to first ask a question. Well, recall, why is it so complicated? Why, why, why is it so difficult to define security intuitively? Well, because there are so many, many resources, so many scenarios, so many channels, so many, so many things playing around. So why don't we do something we usually do uh, in composable frameworks and modular arrays? So here is the optimistic idea. Let's make a simple statement about one channel that sends one message. This is the type of channels that Wally all uh, discussed up to this point. Uh, and we want to say that if we have many channels in, in parallel, then of course the security follows clearly, but by composition, if we make a statement for one channel. Uh, the problem is that this does not work so much for secure messaging because everything depends on, on everything else. And security guarantees of a channel, whether it provides confidentiality or not, for example, uh, will change dynamically on, depending on whether some message is delivered on, on another channel. Um, so to be concrete, let's try to execute our optimistic idea on one channel between Alice and Bob. So this channel is waiting for Alice to, to send a message. By default, if nothing happened yet, this, we would like that this ideal channel provides confidentiality and authenticity, right? Uh, but it could happen that in some other memory, um, some other part of the system, Bob state leaks, then we lose confidentiality. It could then happen that Bob sends a message, Alice receives this message, then confidentiality is, is restored. So again, this, this changes dynamically based on other channels. Now, if Alice's state is corrupted, confidentiality should not be affected, but authenticity will be lost. Uh, so there are too many dependencies kind of, at the first glance at least, to, to make a reasonable state, a reasonable modular statement. Uh, and in the next slide, I want to show you how we nevertheless managed to um, make a statement about one message channels. So the high level idea is that a statement will consider guarantees of a single channel for a single message, but it will be aware of other resources in the system. So this, uh, we only consider guarantees of one channel, but there are other channels whose guarantees we do not consider. Uh, now, this channel will have dynamic confidentiality and authenticity guarantees. As we said, this is needed. So uh, it will be parameterized by these two predicates, confidential and authentic, which control um, whether certain actions are available to the adversary if. So conf confidential controls whether uh, if can read the message and uh, authentic controls whether if can inject the message. And these predicates depend on inputs to other channels and other resources in, in the system. So what this means is that this channel is actually a sub-module of a larger resource with other channels, with other memories, and so on. Uh, and these, um, and it can depend, so the confidential and authentic pre predicates of our channel whose guarantees we consider depend on inputs to other resources. Uh, and we will talk about these um, other inputs as events. So any input is an event that gets in this, say, global event list. So there will be a, an event list for this resource and uh, various resources, various inputs are recorded as events in the list. And now confidential and authentic predicates take as input the, the list of these events and change dynamically based on these events. So uh, going back to the example, uh, if pops, if there is an input from the free interface somewhere that corrupts a memory, uh, this records the event pops memory leaked and the confidential predicate um, switches the, um, the switch and if can now read the message. Then if there is some input from uh, read from Alice, meaning that she receives a message on a channel uh, and uh, yeah, Bob's message is delivered, this switches the then this makes the confidential predicate switch the, um, the switch back and if cannot read the messages anymore. Uh, if Alice is then corrupted, then the authenticity switch switches the, the channel back to uh, switches the channel to not authentic. Uh, so in this view, kind of you can you can somehow imagine that um, I, I th so this is very high level. I it's it's you can see that the paper and uh, it's it's much more complicated to actually formalize this. But on a high level, I think it should be super clear. Um, yeah. So uh, 
if we make a statement about one channel, it seems intuitively true because these other channels also have other confidentiality and authenticity predicates, right? It should uh, be clear that the statement for the overall system with many sub-modules follows from this. Um, okay, so, so this is how we tamed dependencies using events. Uh, and finally, the structure type of statements. This is again a, a simple concept. And the idea is that the protocol should enhance properties of a resource. So um, let's take our standard statement where we take uh, um, a, a channel with some confidentiality and authenticity guarantee guarantees and the protocol constructs a, a channel with better guarantees. So the standard way to do this would be to say that in the real world, so on the left, uh, confidential is always false and authentic is always false. We take an insecure channel and we construct something that is always confidential and always authentic. This is kind of the, the usual um, way of thinking. And now in this, this work, we already parameterized uh, the resources by um, confidential and authentic uh, predicates. So we would like is something better. We start with a channel with arbitrary confidential and authentic guarantees, and we construct something with better guarantees. And this is what constructive cryptography allows us to do naturally. For example, um, we can have the confidential star, so the better confidential predicate being true, if and only if the, the left predicate, so the real predicate is true, or some memory storing a, a key did not leak. So we end up with something that is strictly stronger. So, so this is the, the type of statements we're interesting, interested in. So to summarize, the free interface allows to model um, arbitrary behavior, so not worst case, as is usually done um, in, the, in, in the literature, I guess. Um, events allow us to um, describe or to tame dependencies between subsystems of, of a bigger system. And we are interested in the stronger statements where a protocol enhances guarantees of, um, of resources. Uh, and as I said, I did not mention commitment problem uh, here, but uh, you can solve it similarly to what Willy mentioned before. And you can see more in, in our paper. So with this, uh, this concludes my, my part. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Marta. Um, so, so, um, so, so, uh, 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 so, so thank you for this awesome, um, awesome uh, uh, tutorial on, on constructive cryptography. I wonder whether we should still, I think I still would like to ask a question, even though it's a sharp one, is that, is that acceptable? Maybe as a session chair, I can decide to do this. So, um, uh, so, so Chenda, you had in this, um, uh, you were um, modeling um, concurrent messaging and uh, so co co concurrent, uh, sorry, not concurrent, synchronous computation. And I was wondering about the relation to um, to uh, concurrent computation because you mentioned verification. And one thing that we do in crypto usually is say, we have like one Turing machine. I mean, like we, we don't talk about Turing machine today, but uh, we have like one machine, it has an activity token and then it pings another machine. And then this machine does something and it's kind of very strange and somehow artificial way in which we kind of formalize things. So now, now in this uh, synchronous model, you're much closer to having this concurrent setup in the way it's actually, it's actually done. And I, I don't know, I wanted to, I wanted to know how you, the, the synchronous machines already sounds like you need to model things differently as than having this activity token as we usually model things. So, so, yes, this is this is a very good question, right? Like, wh where are the activations? How does this, how does the distinguisher interact with the system, and so on, right? So, so in our model, we only make statements about uh, the subset relation, right? It, it's it's like equality of functions in some sense, right? Like what the function or, or the random system in the real world is equal to to the ideal to one of the systems in the ideal world, right? We don't need to talk about how do you schedule the inputs to the resource or anything, right? Like, there is no distinguisher if you wish so, right? I see because the computation of the different things are independent so they don't interleave or... 
Yes. So okay. it doesn't Do you matter. Hear me? No, yes, yes. No, it's okay. Um, let me just compliment what, what uh, Chenda said. You know, we, we only model what you may want to express. If, if you are in a model where you care about computation and tokens moving around, if you, if you say, we care about this, then of course you have to model it. But synchronous protocols, the guarantees they give, they don't have this. And if you now introduce them in order to formally or mathematical reason about it, it's an unnecessary language element. You could call it a language element that allows you to talk about it maybe, but it's, it's not necessary. Um, mathematical, it's, it's like, you know, if we talk with the object function, the mathematical object function, it's completely well-defined. If you later say, but now I care about, care about how it's computed on a machine, then say, oh, let's talk about computation on a machine, but the function itself is just a function. In that sense, it's not necessary to have, you know, a, a concrete model. And anyway, you know, whatever we do, we stop at some level in, in abstraction. We don't talk with the electrons jumping around the wires, talk about more abstract things. And in the same sense, it's perfectly fine to stop at this very general abstraction level. We just have these, these functions. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's very useful. Okay. I have another question where I'm probably not thinking on the right level of extraction. So, um, so um, Uli, you, you mentioned adding up epsilons at some at some point. And so, in in the language that I usually use, like an epsilon is something like it's an advantage of some adversary composed with a reduction. Um, and, and so there is a notion of, of cost and, and when I when I make when I make game hops I, I replace things like successively and my reduction the complexity depends on what I what I replaced before because I might replace an inefficient system by a more efficient system. And and so I was I think these things somehow disappear in in the in I would in say the way they become about things. This is right? So first of all, we have to distinguish between two things. If, if, if we are not going to invoke an adversary multiple times in a reduction, right? then what I said goes completely through. Now, of course, it's quite something to say the adversary is really an algorithm. It's not nature. If you look outside of the window, it's really an algorithm that is that you even have access to the code and you can rewind and stuff like that. But if you do that, then you need to, uh, this is all still within this theory, but then I would need to introduce an abstract reduction theory, which can be done and so on, and explain what you want to hear. But for the examples I did, you know, I would rather say the, the overall system after you've plugged in all the protocols together and everything, I give you an abstraction of that. And of course, in that system, you will see an event for example, the event that uh, the collision occurs or something like that. And then, you know, you have to ask yourself, do I believe this could happen in this system? And you see how much computing power is there in the system. You, you could do this analysis for you, but we will not do reductions. But of course you could, if you wanted to read out of what we do as corollaries, you can somehow do reduction statements. You know, you could, but, but you wouldn't want them. They're not needed. It, it's even more explicit than reduction statements. So, like you, the example with a collision, right? You could not even design, define collision resistance for a single hash function. We don't talk about this, we just talk about the collision event. Right. Yeah. Great. But it could be done. I could, I could phrase it closer to what you used, but still abstractly. And then the object of a distinction would be defined. And, and uh, abstractly, right? And, and there would be mappings of this. There would be a notion of cloning a distinction or multiple independent instantiations, which are abstract concepts, not concrete concepts. And of course you can, you can prove stuff at that level. And then it also holds for an instantiation where these objects are real machines and, and have randomness and so on. So if I may ask, um, so yeah, since uh, we have this formula that's theme, I believe you have some work already in, you know, bringing your uh, the the constructed cryptography framework to the formal methods approach, or vice versa, right? You already have 
been working on formalizing this as a formal methods approach? Well, yes. So maybe yes and no in a certain sense. So I've collaborated with, uh, with people at ETH uh, on this. Uh, we have a paper at, at CSF that explains certain things, but you know what I pre th this this doesn't directly relate to what I'm saying here because in a certain sense we model things in ex in existing formal system to show it can be done and so on. And, but I would imagine if I use the term formal methods in this talk, I would imagine you, one does it from scratch in a certain sense. In in a, in a certain sense, right? Uh, like you capture this abstract, like like you would capture. If you do algebra on a computerized system, you'd capture the axioms and you would have a proof methodology. I imagine redoing it. And whenever people think about using their particular system where they have captured some statements and so on, then sometimes it's difficult to say now you should do this because it's targeted towards a specific type of system. Okay. But maybe a very important point to make is the following that not uncommonly. In, in the space of formal methods and security, the security statement depends on the actual framework, right? And this is in a sense strange because we should first think about which statements we want to prove. This is what I talked about, what would be meaningful to prove. And as a secondary important, but completely secondary question is, uh, how do you prove it? Do you prove it formally? And what should not happen is that the moment you say, I now do formal proofs, you have to change the kind of statements you make. This, this, would, not, this would somehow not fit, right? Mm -hmm. and, and often that is the case. So I imagine actually, you know, possibly formalization, maybe not from scratch, but, but, but um, okay. and, and in a simple way, relatively simple way. So and that's the example of, uh, yes, if, uh, I mean, of course, even, you know, cryptographers, theory cryptographers have, not fully familiar with all the you know, nuances of uh, constructed cryptography, but much less so the formal methods community. Is there a, like a tutorial written survey or something that would serve as a good starting point? So, I mean, that's... I mean, this tutorial was a good starting point, but you know, to go, there's a lot more to it, right? So right. go further. I mean, the abstract theory, the way I talked about it, is not written up. And this is because Renato and I are just slow and have so many things on our agenda. It's several years now, right? But it was also possible in the sense that we really discovered new things. At some point, we realized it's about specifications, not about simulators. The original paper talked about simulators, right? And this is a, a major step, I believe, to think like we don't do. And so we have discovered several steps that are actually Good, they're not embedded in, a, in some release of the framework, but, uh, but unfortunately the ultimate paper together with an appendix that explains lots of examples and so on does not exist. What exists is a significant number of papers that one can look at should be understandable, okay? Uh, at least as understandable as if you see other frameworks where you know, a specification is given of some kind of system and so on. And, and one should be able to start working with it, at least if one contacts us and, and, and so on. Uh, but of course, one of my main, main goals is to write this whole thing up in the ultimate clean form. That's my, so hopefully my if, dream, uh, it will become tutorial, cool, but yes. I don't... So, so, there is, yeah. so there is actually it a very pressure on me to do it, yes. So there is a related question by uh, uh, Nadim Kobisi, which I think was, uh, was uh, for uh, for Mata's talk. So the question was, uh, will the formalization of ratcheting potentially allow for ratcheting to be expressed more succinctly in formal verification scenarios, allowing for faster verification, simpler proofs on ratcheting protocols? I mean, the speculation question for Mata, I guess. But... Uh, yeah, I, I guess so. So uh, um, it's kind of a hard question because I don't know too much about um, formal methods or at formal verification or at least formal... So someone's uh, making an echo. Is it me? Uh, no, it's Wally, I think. Hi. Thank you, Wally. Um, so, so I don't know much about uh, formal verification of, in particular, uh, ratcheting protocols. Right? It's not really the the thing you normally do. It's not one. Um, uh, yes, so so you, you have this kind of healing and dynamic properties. And um, one, one thing I can 
say is that uh, one, one reason why this is so complicated is that there are so many, many scenarios um, and the properties change different, uh, change dynamically based on the, the scenarios. And in general, computers seem to be better at dealing with many scenarios than, than humans. Uh, and so I, I think maybe um, a, a better contribution of this work is, is making this modular so that we can actually make uh, cryptographic proofs about secure uh, messaging. Um, is, is this the person who, so someone raised that, uh, do they want to interact? I'm not, con I'm not sure. Uh, no, this is someone else. This is someone else, okay. okay. Yeah, so, so I, I I, I, the, the short answer is I'm not really sure, but um, can I speak? Uh, it could Ali. Be. Can I can I speak? Hello. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Next uh, thank you. Last thank question, you. I guess. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity. And this is Anil, madam. Go ahead. Uh, this is Anil. Actually, madam, I have a, a small doubt regarding the, when we are providing security to an SMS. Uh, we uh, you are using some methodology. Actually, uh, can we have a better methodology to means is there any alternate methodology to do this uh, to provide a security to SMS in order to provide a confidentiality and integrity or authentication? I did not get so, so that. Actually, are uh, there alternate we, methodologies for giving security guarantees? Is that your question? Yes, yes, exactly, sir, exactly. So uh, other than we, we worked on uh, how to provide a security to an SMS by using elliptic curve cryptography. Oh, no, no. Okay. You're asking something about SMS. That's a much more application specific question. Yes. So, um, yeah. So, I, I would say that's an orthogonal question to uh, what's here. So, whether, unless you are asking, you know, can this framework be used to model specific uh, public key cryptography? Yes, yes. yes. Concepts? Uh, with so the we, of and yes, so yes, yes, yes. Finally, what I'm asking is that, uh, so what kind of techniques we use or what kind of uh, public cryptography is suitable in order to provide such kind of application for SMS? So is my question is not relevant to the session, maybe, but slightly I have some idea uh, with the ECC, elliptic curve cryptography. So I'm uh, trying to map this SMS with uh, this technique. If my question I'm not is entirely yes. sure, yeah, I'm not sure entirely if it's a um, uh, good fit for this uh, tutorial, but I guess uh, I would probably it's... reformulate it as this, you know, say things like Diffie Hellman um, uh, and security based on Diffie Hellman um, assumption. How, you know, at what level do they show up in your framework, right? Uh, I, I think it's actually a, a good question in the sense that. It, it demonstrates the main goal of such work is to modularize, to be able to talk about something that, let's say, what I talked in this uh, in this tutorial, without need to talk about other aspects like which elliptic curve crypto would you use, and, and so on, and is that hard, and so on. If you can divide things into different domains, uh, this is exactly what allows us to work scientifically. Another example is some, you know, the construction of computers. You can talk about constructing a computer independently of, of the constructing software, for example, and so on. And being able to reason independently is, is a key to modularity and to be able to take complexity. In that sense, it is good if what I present is not at the same time what would give you proofs of elliptic curve crypto or something like that. Okay, I guess uh, we are probably way over time. So yeah, thanks uh, Uli and Namata uh, for uh, you know fabulous uh, tutorial, especially at such a short notice. So you know, thanks for uh, accepting our invitation. So hope uh, you know we you can hang around for the rest of Indocrypt. Uh, we have some you know, exciting program. Um, but right now we will go offline. So maybe Srinivas, you could announce, uh, or one of the organizers, if you're around, you could announce the next uh, plan. Oh yeah, yes, I will do. So in about 45 minutes, uh, we are streaming uh, pre-recorded talks. Uh, authors will not be there to answer your question. It's it's just we are streaming the pre-recorded talks. 
nonetheless you we have created a topic in the zulip chat where you can post your question and hopefully others will look at it later and get back to you and then we are at uh, 7:30 india time we are having the, the opening uh, session of indocrypt 2020 so hope to see you all there and also importantly we are arranging a rum session tomorrow so for that we are actively or eagerly looking for contributions uh, and deadline is in about 7 uh, hours so please contribute something to that okay. yeah thanks so thank you from my side yeah. it was a pleasure doing this thank you you're welcome thank you, thank you. yeah thanks all okay, okay. so i will uh, close the session thanks so bye bye thanks bye bye, bye. bye.